afternoon to all of you present here and all the viewers watching. Uh, on behalf of the Center of Policy Research and Governance, I extend a very warm welcome to everyone and thank all the participants for joining us today in our webinar on the topic, India's Vaccine Diplomacy in COVID-19, Impact and Prospect. The Center for Policy Research and Governance is an organization of inquisitive brain from all walks of life with a high level of experience in education, economics, democracy, governance issues, and analyzing and formulation of policies in these areas. It has published several types of research on various areas, including governance, international relations, agriculture, education, social and economic issues. Previously, CPRG has worked on many topics in collaboration with the state governments and several reputed institutes, including the sustainable development model for the hilly states in new emerging India with the government of Himachal Pradesh. We are also researching the relevance of Gandhi and economic models in contemporary times in collaboration with ICSSR in the state of Delhi and Assam. Our collaborations also include studying the impact of COVID-19 on educational institutes in the state of Uttarakhand. Recently, we have signed MOUs with premier institutes like the Hindu College, the St. Stephen's College, and OP Hindu Global University. At the same time, we have had students from various universities like the Harvard National University of Singapore attending our educational and internship programs. The Director of Center of Policy Research and Governance, Dr. Ramanand, has joined us today. Dr. Ramanand is a PhD in education from the Delhi University and has a master's in Dalit and tribal studies from the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. He was a policy advisor with the Ministry of Education on edu national education policy and contributes to News 18, The Print and Times of India on various policy and social issues. Thank you, sir, for joining the webinar. Let me now take this opportunity to introduce to you all our distinguished guest speaker for the day, Mr. Prameet Pal Chaudhary. Mr. Prameet is the foreign editor at Hindustan Times and has served as a senior journalist in a career spanning over three decades. He has been a media fellow at Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, South Asia fellow at Henry Stimson Center, and a visiting fellow at his alma mater, the Cornwall University. Presently, he is a fellow and head of strategic affairs at the Ananta Aspen Center of India, an advisor to two prominent consultancies the Rhodium Group and the Bova Group Asia. He has also served two terms on the Indian government's National Security Advisory Board. Mr. Chaudhary is among India's most prominent commentators on the country's political and economic relations with the rest of the world and actively writes on the analysis of Indian foreign policy and the political economy. Sir, it is our honor to have you amongst us today. And on behalf of CPRG, I thank you for accepting our invitation and joining us today. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the day, Dr. Abhishek Shivasta. Dr. Shivasta is an assistant professor in Diplomacy and Disarmament Division, Center for International Politics, Organizational and Disarmament in the School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. He is teaching introduction to global politics and theoretical approaches of international relations. Dr. Abhishek is also the vice chairman of the World Organization of Students and Youth. Thank Dr. Abhishek for joining us today, and I would like to now graciously invite him to take on with the further proceedings of this webinar. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Soria, and thank you, CPRG, for inviting me to moderate this session um, on uh, India's vaccine diplomacy in COVID-19 impact and prospects. This is a very pertinent uh, topic in today's um, uh, global issue. And I also welcome Mr. Prasen, uh, Mr. Pramit Pal Chaudhary. Uh, he is a noted journalist, senior journalist and former, uh, as Soria mentioned, um, and a foreign editor in Hindustan Times. <clears throat> in the beginning of 2020, um, the world has encountered with COVID a pandemic which shook the entire humanity. At the early stage, uh, nobody have a clear, any clear idea against this global problem. But now we have number of vaccines. Uh, we know the Corona protocols and people are now aware about the Corona appropriate behavior. Uh, but what India is doing and what India has done uh, before uh, Corona or the, in 21st century for over the past two decades, um, India has acquired the reputation of being the pharmacy of the world. 
as it's a strong generic pharmaceutical industry has been uh, supplying affordable medicines uh, conforming to quality standards to the global market in the wake of india's vaccine matri program or vaccine diplomacy uh, i request uh, mr chaudhry to put his initial words then uh, we'll have some conversation and then uh, i request soria to keep your eye on youtube and facebook live because uh, this session is on live so you can collect questions from facebook and uh, youtube and after that we'll take questions from um, uh, the audience Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you uh, for uh, inviting me here. Um, I'm going to speak. I'll do some introductory comments to give an overview of what, so we say, the rise and, and uh, decline of vaccine diplomacy under India and give some thoughts as to what its future uh, might lie in. Um, as you probably know, we had, uh, after the so-called first wave of the COVID pandemic hit India, from about September, we saw last year, we saw our cases, our caseload drop dramatically. And from September to, to February uh, of this year, we saw the COVID uh, cases in India drop off. Um, but in the meantime, we had also ramped up COVID vaccine production. And as you know, we had two major companies, uh, the Serum Institute of India, uh, which was producing Covishield, the Indian version of Astra, the AstraZeneca COVID vaccine as well as uh, an indigenous one developed by Bharat Biotech, which we know as Covaxin. The two of them, the two companies combined were producing about 4 million doses a day uh, by the end of last year. But our vaccination rates were quite low. We were, did only, we were vaccinating at about half a million a day, resulting in an enormous surplus uh, of uh, COVID uh, doses of one, one and a half million a day. Both Serum and Serum Institute was already committed under the COVAX scheme, which had been put together by Bill Gates and which India was a member of, uh, committed to a large chunk of its production, had already been prepaid um, uh, to be donated to the COVAX scheme and then distributed among lower income countries around the world. So it argued that it should be, it what did begin to in fact export under the COVAX scheme, but both they, uh, both uh, Serum and uh, Bharat Biotech argue that they shouldn't be allowed to export because one, as I mentioned, they had surplus doses. The doses had a life, uh, expect a uh, shelf life, and many of them were about to expire if they were not allowed to export in larger quantities. Um, and of course, there was a huge global demand. By February, over 90 governments had, had requested, had sent official requests to the Indian government asking for COVID vaccines. So given the low case load that India had at that point, the excess production that we had, um, and the low vaccination rates uh, that we were carrying out at the time, India then opened the doors uh, to vaccines. And you, Prime Minister Modi gave a, a speech at the UN General Assembly announcing the vac vaccine Moitri um, scheme in which India would present uh, um, vaccines across the world. Uh, we began exporting uh, quite large numbers. And by April, uh, as many of you know, we had reached 66 million doses uh, had been exported from India. Uh, over half of them were under COVAX or under grants, uh, were basically aid programs and were donated. Uh, about 40% were, were bilateral commercial deals in which the uh, market price, uh, price was, was, was charged. Um, while obviously the COVAX, uh, about roughly 30% um, of the vaccines we exported were under the COVAX scheme, and the COVAX uh, system had a specific way in which those, those vaccines were distributed around the world, which India did not control, a lot of the other vaccines that we did had a certain geopolitical touch to them. The bulk, the largest number of our vaccines were given to our neighboring countries. Uh, Bangladesh was the single largest recipient. Uh, Bhutan, Nepal, Sri Lanka all received vaccines from us. We also distributed to a number of African nations and Middle Eastern countries that we were work we had good relationships with, and that we were seeking to develop a better relationship with. So, uh, and then. Um, 
In a few cases, we also contributed to countries specifically to counter China's influence because China was the only other major exporter uh, of vaccines at that at that point in the world. Their Sinopharm and Sinovac vaccines were available. However, their vaccines, unlike ours, did not have uh, had not had received regulatory approval in most countries, and in particular. Uh, the we at least with the case of COVID Shield, we had a vaccine that had been approved by the WHO, and China at that point did not. But uh, a small anecdote, for example, we had a, an interesting case in Paraguay, uh, a, a, a mid small uh, Latin American country, which is one of the few countries in the Western Hemisphere that recognizes Taiwan and does not have diplomatic relations uh, with the People's Republic of China. So they began to obviously have a COVID problem. Uh, we're desperately looking for vaccines. China immediately said, we're happy to give you, but you must de-recognize Taiwan uh, and restore diplomatic relations. Paraguay was reluctant to do that, but since neither Europe uh, or the United States at that point are exporting vaccines, uh, they turned to India, a country that in fact did not even have an embassy uh, in Paraguay. Uh, but when we realized that they, this was a, partly a geopolitical as well as humanitarian issue, uh, India sanctioned uh, uh, an emergency shipment of 200,000 um, COVID shield vaccines was sent to Paraguay, uh, as well as opening up an embassy uh, to, to, uh, as part of that uh, agreement. Um, but as we all know, by March, our cases began to rise again as the beginning of the second wave uh, took off. And by April, that had become reached a, a pro crisis proportion to the level that it became politically impossible more than anything else for India to export anymore. And we imposed an export ban, uh, including uh, refusing to fulfill our last set of obligations under the COVAX scheme and saying that all, all such vaccines must now be diverted domestically. But April was many ways until this ban was imposed was the high point, if you wish, of Indian vaccine diplomacy. We were genuinely seen as the country that was, uh, as is mentioned, not just the vaccine center of the world, uh, but in many ways a global savior because there was a lot of suspicions about the Chinese uh, vaccine. Uh, America was refusing to export any vaccines because it was deeply, uh, had its own problems. And the European Union uh, was exporting, but largely to Britain, to the United Kingdom, uh, because of contractual obligations and its own COVID, and its own, uh, COVID situation meant that it had almost nothing left to export after that. Russia was exporting a very small amount, uh, but it did not have much production facility. But then obviously when we imposed our export ban, our vaccine diplomacy, if you wish, uh, left us a, a large number of friends, but we then began, if you wish, to not further expand our profile since we, we then turned inwards and have continued to this day maintaining an export ban uh, as we struggle or just as we just beginning to come out of the second wave. In the meantime, China has taken over a lot of that space. It is now by far the largest exporter, has become the largest exporter of COVID vaccines in the world. However, uh, for a number of technical reasons, their vaccines are not as good or as, as have slightly lower standards of efficacy. Um, and in particular, they do not seem to have a very long lasting impact. They have to be, re they have to be replenished and boost, uh, booster shots have to be given within two or three months. But given in a world where you don't have anything else, obviously countries are still being grateful to accept them. But China has also been somewhat less generous in terms of, the, of how it's presented them. Most uh, of its, its shipments have been commercial. Um, rather than being grants. And it until recently, I don't believe it was part of the COVAX scheme at all. Um, but China is now represents 50% of all the COVID, the, the COVID uh, vaccinations that have been produced. Um, and about half of the world's uh, exports are from China. However, America joined in in uh, last month. We saw with the Biden administration coming in and the beginning of the decline of the COVID wave in America. America began exporting and has, has announced at least with export 20 million doses and has begun emergency shipments to various countries, including India, uh, where we will be getting 7 million from Moderna. So where do we stand? Where is COVID, what is vaccine diplomacy going to go now? 
So for India, the obvious thing is that while our caseload has begun to fall, uh, it's clear uh, from our experience of the first wave as the seropositivity rates, the, the degree of an natural antibodies created by infections in the country, which is now at about 68% of the rate, recent surveys, will only last for about two to three months. That's what happened after the first wave. That's we had a break last time. So in the meantime, we must very rapidly increase our vaccine vaccinations because that alone will provide you long-term security against um, <clears throat> the return of, of, of the COVID. So we have done that. We've, uh, we've slowly been increasing the vaccine uh, vaccination program. And right now, I think we're averaging about five, five or six million uh, uh, a day. But the government's very clear that it needs to raise this to about 10 million a day to avoid a so-called third or fourth wave coming, taking place. Um, right now, however, we don't have a surplus then because at present, Covishield and Covaxin production in India in July was about 150 million uh, combined. Uh, if with any luck, new vaccines, the Sputnik, uh, the Covavax, the Corvavax uh, come in, uh, into play and the production lines take off, uh, that should rise to about 200 million plus. Um, and then probably by October, we'd be looking at about a 400 million dosage uh, production. If that were to happen, <clears throat> it's very hard to predict because many of our previous predictions have run into technical problems. Um, we will then be in surplus. Uh, if you can just simply calculate 30 days of a month, 10 million doses a day, 300 million. If we go over 300 million doses a month production, we'd automatically generate a surplus, uh, at which point India can, in theory, begin exporting again. Uh, and the hope is that by October, maybe November more likely, because I think the government will wait to see whether the festive season in October triggers another wave of, of uh, COVID, we could probably see India returning, if you wish, to the export, uh, COVID export manufacturing. Keep in mind that we also have existing international obligations on the export side that we are contractually obligated to. One, as I mentioned, is COVAX, which we still have not fulfilled uh, our obligations under the COVAX scheme, and we have already been paid for many of those. The Sputnik, uh, under the agreement with the Russian Sovereign Wealth Fund that we have, uh, we must manufacture, uh, we are supposed to manufacture as much as 200 to 300 million doses a year, but already about two thirds of that production has been earmarked for export by next year to the, to the Russian Sovereign Wealth Fund's clients across the world. And they again have paid money for this. Um, and finally we have, and the most recent development has been the Quad Summit uh, where heads of state summit, which was held. And under the agreement there, uh, Japan and America will pay money, have paid money in fact uh, for the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, which has not yet received clearance in India, but which can be produced and has a partner in the biological e company, uh, and we are an estimated one billion doses uh, under the present agreement will be manufactured by India and distributed across the Indo-Pacific to other countries. Again, all for export, though that again will happen sometime next year. A large number of other contracts, uh, smaller ones kind of by other companies, which we have not yet received clearance or not clarity of coming in next year. But we have already a large number of international obligations um, with the our second wave slowly dying out. But as long as we are able to, and only if we are able to get our vaccination program going, will we be able to see a return of vaccine diplomacy by India and as I've said, the hope is in the best case scenario, we're looking like that happening in October or November. With that, I'll end my opening statements and turn it back to you, Dr. Srivastava. Oh, thank you. Uh, it was very enlightening. Uh, thank you for, the, for your initial, initial words. And you have rightly pointed out the different attitudes of different countries like America, Italy, um, very hesitant to uh, export raw materials. China has put some preconditions. So uh, 
now i'll take this discussion a little forward a little uh, with these um, your uh, words that during the covid pandemic uh, we have seen three sections of globalization uh, the american model where they have put restrictions on the raw materials to develop vaccine other is chinese model where they have put some free condition to the country for vaccine and the indian model we provide uh, vaccines uh, as we believe in the philosophy of vasudev kutumbakam that is world is one family um, um, uh, i i can quote um, dr jay shankar has mentioned that this is the india's civilizational commitment to uh, provide uh, vaccine to the other country so how do you assess all these incidents all together that uh, how uh, you see the uh, globalization uh, the open world and the more and, and the america the country like america behavior was against uh, globalization yeah i think in it would be hard to explain why else would it this way the, what were the motives behind the different vaccine diploma, diplomacies if you wish uh, of the three big or even four big exporting centers vaccine exporting centers and i think fundamentally they derived from their domestic conditions as i mentioned india could afford to be generous because we believed we had more or less overcome uh the covid pandemic uh, after the so called first wave uh and therefore we we could afford to be generous we were the world's largest uh, vaccine manufacturers um and we had a large number of already pre-existing commitments under the covax scheme uh but obviously from april onwards we then turned around and said actually no we can't be that generous anymore uh and we began to we stopped all of our production uh, all of our exports altogether and if you wish became an isolationist or protectionist uh, vaccine nationalism or protectionism uh, became our our became our overriding strategy or policy so in effect we have gone through two big phases two big shifts in our of how we handled that uh america similarly under the trump administration began with an enormous vax uh, covid wave uh the, it was a trump administration that imposed the so called or invoked the so called defense production act and said we will not export um and um we um we had no uh, capacity if you wish uh, they had no willingness or capacity to to export uh the biden administration came in and at least publicly said they would have a different point of view but because they continue to face problems of an internal covid uh covid their covid uh, cases didn't start to drop until about 2 months ago they began they continued that policy and only just begun that they only announced the reversal of that policy as you know last month um I mean as you correctly pointed out even then there was an additional problem that they are the primary producers of vaccine inputs India imports 215 inputs for its vaccines from the United States alone the single largest source and they had blocks on those exports as well uh, and it required our uh, the foreign minister Dr Jay Shankar to visit Washington to get those eventually uh, opened up and and reversed um so america if you wish has had a consistent policy and almost completely driven by the internal crisis that they faced not only in terms of the covid crisis they faced but in terms of the political polarization that had developed internally between trump uh, the democrats and the republicans on the right and the left which resulted in biden even after he came to power in january being reluctant to reverse this for fear that he would be attacked by the right wing of america of effectively putting foreign lives ahead of american lives um and it reflected i think the political weakness of the establishment in washington that it has taken them so long for them to reverse that policy um china was an in more interesting case because while they were the origin the it began the wuhan the wuhan breakout was the origin of the pandemic they were able to control this through an extraordinarily strong measures that they were able to impose on their people uh very quickly uh, much faster than many other parts of the world uh and though they've had a number of breakouts it's a little uncertain because they've not been very transparent with them uh 
um, they've been more or less able to hold those, use standard containment procedures, administrative containment procedures, as well as a mixture of vaccines. But it's interesting to see, if you look at Chinese exports of vaccines, they've often stopped and then started again, and stopped and then started again, depending on what happens domestically. Now, obviously, Xi Jinping and the Chinese leadership yeah face no domestic opposition. So for them, the domestic political situation doesn't matter. But they are they are still increased wary of having the idea of exporting at a time when they still have cases. But the ability of China to domestically control the pandemic in, inside their own, the COVID spread inside their own countries, then gave them the ability to export. Uh, and even if the quality, if you wish, of the vaccines was, was, was less, uh, it didn't make any difference in a world in which any vaccine was it was acceptable. So the Chinese policy, I would also argue, has been relatively consistent, and again reflects their their domestic their domestic position. The European Union was an interesting example. It was the fourth the fourth uh, largest exporter, uh, fourth largest producer of COVID vaccines. They were driven contractually by the fact that their biggest producer, AstraZeneca had to sell to the United Kingdom under their contracts that they had, even though the United Kingdom by then had left the European Union. Um, and so the European Union had a bizarre situation where, as you as you probably read, in which they were finding themselves facing a COVID wave in their own country, facing shortages of vaccines, but exporting uh, huge amounts, most of their vaccine production overseas to Britain. Um, they were unhappy about it. They had huge fights with AstraZeneca, uh, but legally were unable to do anything because the courts basically said that AstraZeneca contractually is, is in the right, uh, which led to some of the European countries importing Russian vaccines or Chinese vaccines in opposition to the Europeans on regulatory system. Now, of course, they now have enough Pfizer and Moderna uh, in their own production that they don't need to worry about it. But the European Union was an interesting case of a very weak domestic structure, uh, unable to impose any solution. And it was effectively completely driven by the corporate system uh, rather than by what the government wanted to do. Uh, thank you. Um, you have mentioned the COVAX and the European Union. And so uh, my next uh, query, uh, I, I'm a little curious, uh, in the global initiative that COVAX, India, and other uh, donor countries have donated a sizable number of vaccines, but still, uh, there are very few producer countries. Um, and the global south, the number of population in global south is lagging behind in the vaccination program because of slow production of vaccine, because of fewer countries are in the production uh, capacity. So at the same time, uh, India has, and South Africa has jointly raised the issue of temporary waiver of IPR at WTO. So right. um, what's your opinion about the IPR issue and regressing role of European Yeah, so the, the issue of vaccine, um, the, pro the problem of vaccine patents, you'll notice it's slowly dying out. Um, it's not that much. Uh, Initially, when it was raised, I think the problem was that a lot of people did not understand how vaccines were actually produced or the difficulties in which vaccine production. Uh, Moderna, for example, waived its patent. It said anybody waived a license and it said right from the beginning, anybody can produce Moderna vaccine. We don't have a problem. Nobody produced it. Why? Because it is de dependent on an enormous number of inputs so, uh, and certain types of technologies, in this case, an mRNA, the most advanced vaccine technology, which requires a lot of skills. You have to have trained scientists, engineers, you have to have a certain kind of equipment, and then you have to have a supply chain. Um, a simple example, we, India doesn't have an mRNA vaccine yet, but even based on the older technologies, we have to import 360 inputs from around the world to produce our own vaccines. 215 of them from America, 109 from Germany, and the remainder from 30 other countries around the world. If one of these inputs does not come in, the vaccine cannot be made. So the point was that the, removing the IPR issue, the patent, was just the beginning of a much larger step, set of steps that had to be done to be able to produce a vaccine. So South Africa, for example, which has no record of producing vaccines, 
um, or very minimal record, even if they had been given the patent waiver, they would have then had to sit down and build the bio level three safety labs that are required to produce a vaccine, import the bioreactors, the bio bags, the equipment, the micro filters. Then they would have had to place orders with almost 300 companies around the world for the inputs to produce the final product. Uh, this is an incredibly difficult operation and would require billions of dollars. So the patents were in many ways the first step to vaccine equity, but by themselves almost irrelevant uh, in, the, in during a, a crisis. Um, the real issue now will be, in my view, is that we have to revisit this after the pandemic is over and say, how do we make vaccine equity uh, something that works better? And you already see that South Africa, Rwanda, I think Kenya, a number of other countries, a lot of governments around the world have said that we're now going to manufacture vaccines. We're not going to depend on imports. Uh, but there still is a supply chain issue that you have to develop. How do you develop the capacity uh, to, well, how do you multiply the supply chain system so that it's a network and you are no longer dependent on one country for that? But it, that's very difficult. Um, even India, which has a long history of vaccine production, struggled uh, when we had that supply chain even temporarily disrupted. Um, and for a lot of other countries, that will be difficult. And, but the whole nature of vaccine production um, and how it's so globalized, um, but so dependent on really just a handful of companies is something that will have to be re-examined when, when the pandemic is over. Ah, thank you. Um, now I'm come, uh, come to the reason, this region, the, um, in early 2021, India are driven by its neighborhood first policy and in its understanding the role of net security provider of the region began providing COVID-19 vaccines on a priority basis to the immediate neighbors. But between January and April, uh, India either sold or granted a total number of, a good number of, uh, around, uh, a good number of 19, uh, 1 crore 95 lakh, 42,000 vaccine doses to the countries of the region. Uh, so how do you see the competition between India and China, as we have seen that uh, China is uh, providing um, vaccine to Ch uh, Sri Lanka, to Bangladesh, Pakistan. So uh, India and China to vaccine supply in the region and who is uh, winning the race <laughs> in this region? <laughs> So as, as you correctly pointed out, when we began uh, the, the, our COVID exports, the bulk of them, or the largest proportion, were exported to the region. Uh, Bangladesh, out of 66 million, 10.5 million were sent to Bangladesh alone, the single largest recipient. Uh, Bhutan, uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Maldives, Seychelles, uh, Myanmar, uh, probably got another three or four million. So we're looking at something on the, on the lines of about 14 or 15 million vaccines being sent uh, to our neighborhood. Even Pakistan was eligible under the COVAX scheme, that we, or whatever we sent yes. to COVAX, Pakistan was a member and was eligible for receiving uh, vaccines under that scheme. So as I said, up to April, we were definitely the kings, kings of the situation. We were literally, uh, um, being praised across the planet uh, for our capacities. Uh, Bloomberg, I remember the story saying the, vac the pharmacy of the world flexes its muscle. We were being praised by world leaders uh, across the board. And then, of course, we ran into our own crisis and ever, all of this ground to a halt um, and so on. To, to be fair, I think I, uh, what I'm struck by is how many, when I've talked to ambassadors from other countries, most countries are actually quite forgiving at the fact that we then decided to break off our supplies. And not only I should add, it's not just a question of supplies. In many countries, they had received the first dose of the COVID shield, but never received the second dose because we didn't, yeah. we had, we didn't uh, by the time the, uh, we had imposed the import ban, even the second doses were not exempt. Uh, for example, Iran had that problem that they received our first dose, but never got our second dose. Uh, which of course reduced uh, the efficacy of the vaccines dr dramatically. Uh, but they were sort of understanding, if you wish, of, of our crisis and the fact that, to be fair, every other country in the world that had faced a crisis like this uh, 
uh, including the Americans, the Europeans, and the Chinese at, at, at earlier on, had all done exactly the same thing. Russia, for example, now is in the midst of its third wave. Uh, they were supposed to send us um, four and a half million, four to five million Sputnik doses in the beginning. That has just basically dried up um, because they, they have said we have to keep it uh, for our domestic purposes. So I think there's an understanding globally that anybody who has a COVID crisis, it's every man for himself. Um, so we've been, should we say, um, not been, uh, we've not received as much criticism as perhaps we should have deserved for this. But definitely it's China that has stepped in um, for the most part into all of this. They were anyway the largest provider for Pakistan. Uh, Nepal went to them and received some vaccines, and Bangladesh also received a shipment. Though, in each case, and I think this is what has been interesting, um, Sri Lanka is also the same, um, is that they've always had some problems. The Chinese, for example, in the case of, of uh, in the case of Bangladesh, uh, their ambassador, the Chinese ambassador, and said that. Given that we've sent you vaccines, Bangladesh was not considered joining the Quad or working with the Quad, which the Bangladesh is obviously uh, on a sovereign issue publicly said that that's unacceptable. And also was a bit of a surprise because Bangladesh had never expressed any interest in working with the Quad and neither had the Quad and we had never raised that issue. Uh, but that resulted in interest in pockets that the Chinese actually reducing the, the cutting the amount of vaccines they were sending. So it actually came out to only come to about 50,000 so far. Um, in the case of Bhutan was interesting. They have, uh, they have maintained that they will not take Chinese vaccines, but luckily other countries in the world chipped in. So for example, I believe Denmark had excess AstraZeneca. So a lot of the European countries have dropped the AstraZeneca vaccine in favor of Pfizer and Moderna because they have better efficacy rates. Um, and those countries have transferred their surplus AstraZeneca to other places. So a lot of them have sent it now to, to Bhutan, uh, partly at our request. Um, and some of them are now picking up Pfizer and Moderna via the American shipments, which have just about, which have just started. So like Bhutan has now the world's highest, most successful vaccination rate. I think they've done 80 or 90% of their population. Second dose was done in just seven days. Um, and so they are now more or less set for, for at least another year or so. Um, Sri Lanka's had a mixed sort of record on that. They did bring in the Chinese vaccines, but the quality was not as good as they'd expected. Um, and Nepal has had a mix of it. Dave, Nepal being very relatively poor has basically taken any vaccine that they can find. Um, but China, as I, China's, I think, to my surprise in many ways, has undermined a lot of the potential goodwill that it could have had from these vaccines. Their supply has been erratic, uh, quality control has been poor, and their insistence on always tying this aid to some larger political or diplomatic means has, has undermined, if you wish, a lot of that uh, willingness to take their vaccines. And as a consequence, they've not done very, they've not done as well as you would have expected, uh, given uh, the, the sheer uh, desperation of many of the countries involved. Yeah. Um, now uh, I'll come to uh, the domestic politics in India and which affect uh, the vaccine diplomacy. As we have seen, there is some play card that our children's vaccine kisi ko kyun de di, some type of thing. Uh, in, in, in India, during the second wave, there was some criticism about the vaccine diplomacy from the opposition because of, we have the federalist structure, we have democracy. So uh, what's your opinion about uh, how this vaccine diplomacy, um, is there any effect on vic vic uh, vaccine, uh, vaccine diplomacy from the opposition, from such uh, language that Hamari Bachobi vaccine did the yeah how does this domestic influence on the India's external policy or the or the vaccination policy or the vaccination diplomacy? Well, I think definitely that was the primary I mean it had a huge impact and I think that was the primary reason we imposed a complete ban on, on exports uh, in, in April was the sense that there was it was the political backlash or the public backlash over the idea that we were exporting even as we were entering this enormous wave of, of COVID cases and deaths made it politically impossible. 
in my personal view, if we had given that we already were contractually obligated to produce them, the government, if it had been, if it, things had been planned better, and then particularly if we had been able to predict to the coming of the second wave, uh, we should have had some sort of a quota system saying that 85% of the production should be for domestic purposes and 15% for exports given our, our requirements, uh, our, our obligations overseas. Uh, but we would have also had to start uh, ramping up production much earlier, which we didn't. And this all revolves around the failure to predict the extent of the second wave uh, when it hit us. Um, See, and I think one of the things, important thing points to note is that on vaccines, the vaccine production is, is almost, is all in the private sector. Uh, all of these are private sector companies. Hmm. Um, most pharmaceutical production is in the private sector. And there are reasons why government, state-owned government companies are very bad at high tech. Uh, it's a very fast moving, very rapid risk, risky uh, sector. Uh, and generally, bureaucrats are very averse to being able to handle it. To this day, one of the reasons we've struggled with vaccine production is the public sector enterprises are simply unable to handle the level of technology required um, for, for good quality vaccines. So one of the problems that we faced right at the beginning on production was that you had to provide a financial incentive for the private sector companies to expand production. So we set the price of vaccines in India at 150 rupees, which was loss making. That's fine. <laughs> they said we're the company is like serious. That's fine, but we have to make our money somewhere else. And so you basically had three options. You could either allow them to sell uh, a portion of their production at a profit in the market rate, like we now have in the private sector sales, the private uh, hospital sales, or the government provided them a subsidy. Uh, of, of a capital subsidy saying we will pay for the building of a new factory um, as, as a sort of public good, or you allow them to export for a profit. Um, one of the reasons our vaccine production, from what I understand, basically plateaued off uh, from the September onwards was in fact that there was no such incentive. The government did not give a capital subsidy. The government did not allow private sector sales. And then by April, it said you can't even export. So at the end of this, most of the private sector companies said, then we'll produce what we do now, but we will not increase our production because we have no means to do so. Now, of course, we've given all of it. We, we allow, we allow, have given a capital subsidy, allowed private yeah. sales. And at some point, yeah, maybe yeah. next year, we'll allow exports as well. Uh, but it was a missed opportunity. It meant that for about four or five months when we could have doubled our, our vaccine production, we didn't uh, because the private sector was simply completely disincentivized from doing so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, this is the, my last question um, that uh, Prime Minister has said that one world, one health, uh, type of concept uh, in uh, G20. I, I, I'm forgetting. I think in G20 meeting, and in uh, and as India has done a remarkable uh, work through supplies of vaccine. Uh, do you see there is any significant change in India's position at global level in post-pandemic world? I think the key of what we've realized is one, as I mentioned, that we are very dependent on global supply chains. Uh, and overly dependent on medicines and products that are imported to even manufacture the medicines that we produce at home. And geopolitically, we are particularly nervous about the APIs or the advanced pharmaceutical ingredients that are imported from China. Um, we saw this with a lot of the medicines that we were trying to use to handle COVID that we was completely dependent on Chinese exports and the prices rose dramatically whenever the Chinese companies decided to increase production. Um, so the, for example, handling black fungus, mucormycosis, was dependent on inputs that were almost all out of China. Oh. 60 to 70 percent of all the inputs to the Indian pharmaceutical industry come from China. So we're now building an API, these new API parks <clears throat> in Telangana, Punjab or Haryana and other places with the idea of bringing back some of that production to, to India. Second, I think we need to recognize now that the 
the new technologies that are coming up, especially mRNA, which was an experimental technology when the pandemic broke out, got emergency clearance. That is the future technology of vaccines. It's not just for COVID, but for everything. It'll be the future on the basis of, for example, uh, cancer, potential cancer uh, vaccines and so on, will all be mRNA. And it's a technology which are so far only one Indian company is even attempting to master, which is Genova, but it still hasn't succeeded. Uh, so we need to move uh, what we've been doing largely has been this uh, attenuated virus uh, technologies and so on that we're using right now. These, while we're admit, they still have a role to play, they're going to now be a shrinking element of the future global market. <clears throat> we need to be now much more globalized in terms of our technology. Uh, we need to be building partnerships with other countries to move to the front of this. And you'll notice that in the recent roadmap that was announced between Boris Johnson and um, uh, Prime Minister and Modi, uh, a large portion of that Indo-UK roadmap is about pharmaceuticals. Uh, and it basically says India is yeah. now prepared to form a global, uh, a government-to-government, -government, b 2 b partnership with a specific country, in this case, UK, uh, partly because a lot of the British companies are already obviously present in India and work with us, but a lot of them have now become non-profits. Uh, you know, uh, GSK, Wellcome Foundation, a lot of them have no longer quite as uh, as uh, avaricious as most pharmaceutical companies are. So we feel that we can work a lot better with them than let's say the American companies, Big Pharma, which we've always had big issues of, of battles over on IPR and so on. So it's very clear we now recognize we now have to build up and I'm hoping we build some more such partnerships, maybe with South Korea, Japan, and, and even the United States, at least to some extent. So I think that element is there. And then third, we've said, invest in India's production capacity. The Quad was the first element of that. You saw the G7 announced, it didn't specifically mention India, but I suspect in the G20, we'll see something of that about a, a billion doses being manufactured by the G7. They don't say where they'll be manufactured, but the money will be raised to do so. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of bilateral agreements, if you wish, also fulfilling them. So India is saying that we can still be the pharmacy of the world, at least some, some elements of it, but you know, what does the WHO say? WHO says we need something like 11 billion doses of COVID vaccine every year. And given yeah. the virus mutates so rapidly, we could be producing these back. We, every year, we all need another dose, set of doses, uh, probably for maybe another five years. Oh. Right now, the world's entire COVID vaccine oh. manufacturing capacity is barely three or four billion. So we're nowhere close to what we need to be. Oh. India is saying, look, we have that capacity. Not only do we have the capacity, more importantly, oh. we have the skilled manpower. No other country in the world has as many oh. lab technicians, uh, vaccine manufacturing experts, uh, API scientists as India does, right? So therefore, we, are the, we should be what you, we could be the next in the next global pharmaceutical world order, we should still be at the center of it. Okay. And we are prepared to play that role. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, that's it from my side. And you have uh, very nicely pointed out the global uh, pharmaceuticals world order. That is a very new term for me. And uh, I think it, it would be uh, more depicted uh, in future. As uh, I, in vaccine diplomacy, we have, uh, we have seen that uh, in second wave, India has received uh, very, um, received uh, many types of uh, oxy uh, health, like oxygen, uh, uh, remdesivir, uh, many types of health across the globe. And uh, I think this is also a, a Response the the positive response of vaccine diplomacy which India had done uh, India has done in uh, in the first uh, in the for, after the first wave. So now uh, I'm stopping myself. Uh, Sh uh, Shori, is there any question uh, from the audience from Facebook from YouTube? You can ask. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'll be putting forth a few questions that we've received from our viewers. 
the first one is uh, in line with what abhishek sir was just saying uh, it is how helpful has vaccine maitri been in the aid received in the second wave of covid well it's been very helpful for other countries uh, uh, because we were at that point virtually the only exporters in january of covid vaccine especially covid vaccines that have been cleared by the who uh one of the key things we've also realized globally uh, in the present crisis is that ultimately medicines are controlled by a domestic regulator uh and unfortunately most domestic regulators are not aligned with each other so it's very easy for a government to say i will export vaccines to you uh but the other kind the recipient country still has to get a regulatory approval uh and it was often very difficult uh, surprisingly difficult to get a regulator to agree because one in a covid situation they could not visit the factory where it was being produced or sometimes the production system that we would make it or another country would make it would be slightly different from what their regulator believed was the correct one and then they would just say no we're not going to allow um you know covid shield from india because it doesn't fulfill uh the way we are supposed to do things even though the final product is identical to what their regulators allowed um so one of the things about vaccine maitri was that we were literally the only player in terms of exports because our it had been cleared by the who and covax had already carried out pre regulatory approvals for this um in addition because india is already a fair india even before the pandemic exported about 25% of the world's exports and vaccines came from india a lot of other countries had already aligned with us the serum institute of india in many ways one of the reasons it could do so well as an exporter is that it had already done the regulatory work uh, bharat biotech which is largely domestic for example has struggled to export because it's never had to deal with those regulatory issues before um so many ways yes i think we they a lot of governments benefited in that first wave uh, you know 66 million that we exported was literally the only thing it's important to realize that often it's not just the i mean the numbers may not sound all that impressive uh but it's often if you wish a the question of public confidence that if i am a government facing a covid crisis and i can say to the i can't tell my people i have any medicine in fact if i go public and say i have no medicine i have no vaccine nothing that can help you uh the result can often be high, high degrees of political instability you know riots and so on but many governments are surprising one day after this is over we'll see how many governments and prime ministers have fallen uh, or been in a severe crisis because of this but a lot of came to be just to be able to go on television and say i am receiving a shipment of 100000 vaccines from india plus x amount of hydroxychloroquine or something like that even if that medically the result was often quite minimal because yeah if 100000 vaccines but i have a population 20 million it doesn't make that much difference but that had a calming impact if you wish on the political stability of that country and that's many ways i think that hasn't really been worked out how useful that was for many governments but i know when i've talked to our foreign ministry they said we have many governments even now even after the export ban that say thank you for sending what you did because we simply had no answers to our people as to what, how we were responding to the pandemic because nobody had a vaccine nobody had any medicines and just to be able to say that we could get something to show a television image of an airplane landing and shipments coming out provided that sense that we were something was being done and restored a degree of stability in our country right yes uh, the next question is uh, does india still stand a chance to renew and become a vaccine exporter surpassing china well surpassing china i'm not certain about that that number <clears throat> something is hard to predict but yes as i said we all once our goal is 10 million vaccines a day so that means we have to produce 300 million um i uh, i have i have a regular chart uh, on my on my computer which i'm completely updating every week trying to figure out how many vaccines we're producing <clears throat> right now 
if everything goes correct, I mean, if all the predictions and all of the promises by various companies come through, we should produce 300 million a month by August. And by sometime in probably October, again, assuming that no, you know, no factories catch fire or something like that, by October, we should be producing 400 million. And as I said, my sense is that once we pass the festive season uh, and we, we absorb the spike in cases that will probably happen, we assume will happen in the October festive season afterwards, um, then by November, we should be in a position to have, we would, should have a surplus of about 100 million doses a month. And by the beginning of next year, uh, the number of doses we'll be producing will actually be astronomically large. I mean, literally in the billions, uh, because you will have Johnson, one billion for the quad. We will have Walkhart's one billion agreement in South Korea. We will have, we have actually, at this point, it'll be almost 30 or 40 different vaccines being manufactured. Uh, we will be easily the world's largest, one of the world, we will match China in terms of production. But I think what is crucial is that because we have much better international tie-ups, uh, almost half of these are done with an international corporation or, or agency, uh, either funding or providing help. We have a better regulatory chance. There's much more confidence in an Indian-made vaccine right now than there is in a Chinese-made vaccine. And that I think, don't think will change. So my personal view is we will begin exporting probably by November, December again. And by the first quarter of next year, uh, we should start to see India uh, exporting on a really large scale. But as I said, this depends on a number of variables, which I can't predict. And probably the most important one is that we don't get another mutant, a mutant version of the COVID hits us and then shows that the, the presence uh, um, wave that we're over uh, doesn't be get triggered a second time or overcomes our vaccines, our present vaccines. Right, and uh, I'll put forth the last question, which is, uh, have our relations with Bangladesh improved by vaccine Maitri or bittered because of the abrupt halt in the promised supply? Well, I mean, I don't think the Bangladeshis, like a lot of other countries, were very happy about this. Uh, and in particular, I think they were unhappy about us stopping our exports to the COVAX system, because in many of those cases, those are medicines that had been paid for in advance. Those are doses that have been paid for in advance. Uh, but fortunately, uh, at least in the period from about April uh, until June, they did not have a major breakout of COVID in Bangladesh. Uh, partly attributable to the fact that so many people had gotten the first dose. Um, so only now are they starting to see their cases take off. But as I said, a lot of countries gave us a free pass on this issue, simply on the grounds that they saw that every, every other country in the world, which had a major breakout of uh, COVID, immediately closed the borders to exports. And this included Russia, China, the European Union and America, so all the only country that export right now. So I think we got a free pass on that. In addition, it seemed a lot of, at least the Bangladeshi elite, it was feasible for them to actually fly to India or to Singapore and other places and pick up uh, the vaccine. One of the good things about Bangladesh today, and I say this not just because I'm a Bengali, uh, but because that uh, it is now a wealthy country. I mean, there's a now a, it's no longer the basket case of Asia, as Henry Kissinger called them. Uh, their per capita income is, is higher. Their GDP is bigger than Pakistan. Their per capita income is neck and neck with ours. Uh, they have $60 billion in foreign exchange reserves. They're the fastest growing economy in South Asia. They're much better off now. And they can actually afford to do a lot of things with which before they couldn't do. Thank you so much for answering those questions, sir. Uh, I'd like to now invite Dr. Ramanan to please uh, conclude. Thanks, sir, for joining the session. And I think COVID-19 has changed the existing uh, foreign policy trends and also exposed the vulnerability of the, uh, of the globalization. Vaccine matrix is also one of the examples of the globalization, but it also presents the realities of the post-COVID-19 world because of the, as you have 
you have uh, kind of explained to us how it has been kind of just about to fail just because of second wave of COVID-19 in India. I think COVID-19 has made the job of foreign policy analysis and commentator more tough to predict or uh, even in the global world just because we know COVID-19 has changed everything uh, from the economics to manufacturing, from the supply line to one-to-one uh, -one relation. It has changed everything. Even it has changed kind of uh, the, the existing parameter of the global cooperation. But undoubtedly, we have to live with this COVID-19 reality, I think, next one or two decades, because COVID-19, maybe COVID-19 will uh, be gone in future, but its effect and its kind of uh, the, the how it has been kind of saved the global policy, it will always exist, I think, at least two to four decades. But I would like to thank you, uh, Pramit sir. It was a very enlightening session, and I was we were expecting that it will be just like a kind of a commentary from the uh, journalist. But it was a more kind of a theoretical perspective from us, uh, from the academic perspective. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abhishek Swasto, for the wonderful uh, moderation, and thank you, sir. Uh, sorry for the kind of arranging all the things. Thanks. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Pramod.